Hi, and welcome to the Morton Brown Family Wealth Weekly Market Update. I'm Katie Brown, and I have Cody Demmel here with me today. Hi, Cody. Hey, Katie. How are you? Good. All right, so this week on the update, a few things that we wanted to talk about. First is the, the Suez Canal blockage, the giant tanker that blocked the canal, and some of the ripple effects of that blockage for nearly a week. And then secondly, we want to touch on the new bill that President Joe Biden is unveiling this week, uh, primarily focused on infrastructure, but a few other things in there as well. And then finally, retirement planning and some of the trends that, that were discovered during a uh, study through the FPA, the Financial Planning Association. So let's start out, Cody, with the, the blockage of that, that tanker in the Seuss Canal. That was just crazy. Um, yeah. The visuals around that were just in- incredible. Uh, what were what were some of your takeaways from that? Yeah, so I mean, first I I never even thought about how big those those tankers were. That it's four football fields long, two hundred and twenty thousand tons. That's how how much it weighs. It's it's just in, incredible the yeah. size of them. And this is so this this canal is one hundred and twenty miles long, and twelve percent of the world's goods pass through it. Every single day, $9.4 billion of goods pass through the canal. And so to have a, a tanker block it for nearly a week, the, the ripple effects to the supply chain are just, you know, it's, it's all going, we're going to see what those ripple effects are going to be in the months to come, but there are definitely some early warning signs about that. Yeah, it's going to be interesting because obviously there's going to be some finished goods that were that are going through the canal, but then there's a lot of unfinished goods that, that we need in the United States and other parts of the world to finish some of the products. It's like one of the examples they gave in the article was microchips. Um, we're already at a little bit of a shortage. So if we have even more of a shortage, I mean, it's going to affect everything from cars to video games, just a whole bunch of different different ways um, that could affect it. And even just the empty containers that the tanker was carrying too. A lot of the challenge with with the supply chain right now is having the containers at the right ports at the right time so you can move the goods or or portions of the goods, like you said, the the supplies to make the manufactured goods um, from one port to another. And so much of what this tanker was doing is just getting containers in the right spot. So all of the delays that that come from that and and the money and the cost delays and everything else. So we'll have to see how how that flows through to the end products and to the consumers. And then Joe Biden. So President Joe Biden is unveiling um, a new infrastructure bill, $3 trillion to help build out the infrastructure of our country. But also there are some things inside the bill that help support some of his initiatives around lowering emissions and and really kind of getting to the point of that the net zero emissions by 2050. That was one of the things that, that he has been talking about for a while. Um, what were some of your observations? And, and this is, you know, there are a number of articles about this. One that we were most recently talking about was on CNBC. It'll be interesting to see. Obviously, the bill hasn't came out yet, so we don't know exactly what's in it. Um, so that will be interesting to see exactly what, what it goes over. But I think I do think it's really good that, that we're focusing on some of the infrastructure we need to get done. Um, I mean, everyone drives around and, yeah, you know, our roads are not the best. Um, let alone in other parts of the country, is redoing some of the highways, some of the railroads, hopefully some of the airports too. So just just getting new technology also in, in some of the, you know, the new electric charging stations and, and so forth. Yes, that was a big piece of it, building like thousands of those electric charging stations and, and really encouraging, creating incentives to move towards those electric vehicles. We'll we'll see. You know, it's interesting because there hasn't been a a lot of legislation that's been passed around reducing the emissions. Um, the last time I think a bill that 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 really focused on it came up was 2009. And since then, you know, I think it's becoming ever more important. I think the awareness has heightened since then. So so we'll we'll see what the sticking points are. I'm sure there are probably going to be some sticking points. In it. We'll see how it, how it progresses. But I think it's good to open the conversation. Then finally, the Financial Planning Association posted a 
um, a survey that was completed. The survey was actually completed through RAND, um, and it was looking kind of specifically at retirees and how they're spending, how well prepared they are for retirement, and then also how they're spending um, in that first 10 years of retirement. Because often that first 10 years is where, you know, you're kind of getting used to the rhythm, you're figuring things out, you maybe are not maybe don't have all those income streams turned on yet if you delay social security or something else. And so the, the draw on the portfolio can sometimes be a little bit heavier um, or your reliance on, on some of those income places can be a little bit heavier in that first 10 years. I, I think a couple of things that, that were interesting in, in that study, they noted that only 18% of individuals, families going into retirement have the, the, the resources, whether through income or assets, to support their full pre-retirement spending levels. And, and so once again, in that, that first 10 years, there's and, and one of the things that was interesting is that they said on a on the whole, 75% of retirees actually reduce their spending. So some people acclimating to the income isn't as great, but then I but then other people who may have been prepared are still reducing the amount that they're spending in the first 10 years. Did you did you pick up on that too, Cody? What were some of your, your thoughts on kind of both sides? Yeah, I thought it was a really interesting article, um, both on unfortunately the, the some of the individuals that aren't able to spend um what they were before going into retirement, um, that only around 18% had enough wealth to cover their pre-retirement expenses so they scaled it back a little bit to make sure that they can live comfortable but then i did think it was interesting how the 18 percent that did have enough wealth they weren't increasing their expenses they were kind of remaining remaining the same so it, it was definitely interesting to see i think there was some behavioral finance in there too um, and then we we sometimes have this conversation with some of our clients too that may be well positioned for retirement but the reason they're well positioned is because they were so disciplined getting up to that point. And so the savings is a habit and, and the, the being, you know, money conscious, budget conscious is, is such a habit that it's almost difficult to kind of reset the mind to say, rather than save, I'm going to spend. And so there's, there's kind of a, a sort of a natural tendency to not dive all in, I guess, to that. Yeah. So on average, they were saying over that, that first 10 years, 75% of retirees reduce their spending on average by 23% over the first 10 years, a little in a pretty smooth line, a little over 2% per year. And, and that's really helpful information for us too as planners, because we often have that conversation under that debate. Do you spend more or less in the early part of retirement? And so to see the majority of people actually spend a little less, you know, we always like to lead our conversations from a conservative bent, um, but that's good good knowledge to have, and I think it I think it makes a lot of sense. So heading into the Easter weekend here, um, Cody, are there any any traditions or any special things that that you're doing with your family? Normally, we go to my my dad's side of the family, so visit my dad's um, family in Hershey. I don't think we will this year, just with everything on uh, the pandemic. So. I know Courtney and I are going to plan on doing like a, a bald scavenger hunt for our two golden retrievers. So Easter egg tennis ball. <laughs> hunt. So, so that'll be interesting and it, it should be a lot of fun. How about you? Oh, that's so cute. That's cool. That's really funny. <laughs> I will say, so Easter egg hunts are definitely something that my family has always done. I mean, even, beyond when we were little, like I remember going back home, you know, in college or as adults and, and even, you know, after being married and my mom putting together these adult Easter egg hunts that were so hard, like she would <laughs> bury stuff like out in the woods and like an acre or two acre plot and be like, okay, go get them. And we would spend hours. We would like tackle each other to get in and out of the door to see who could get the most eager Easter eggs. That sounds fun though. Yeah, yeah, it was a ton of fun. This year's going to be, well, I'm sure there will probably be an Easter egg hunt. We'll, we'll have some fun. Uh, we're actually getting together with my in-laws. So a hello to Chris and Lori Brown. Um, very excited to see them this weekend. That'll be a lot of fun. Um, we haven't seen them since last summer. So I, I love now as, as the vaccine's getting distributed that cautiously we can all start to get together at least a little bit more. So looking forward to that. But Yeah, that's great. Yeah. 
And we wish you all the best. Um, if anyone has any questions or any topics you'd like us to cover, please feel free to reach out. We'd love to hear from you. In the meantime, take care and we'll see you next week. Bye.